Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a guest expert interview with Seth Perler. Seth is an executive function coach. Before we dive into the episode, I want to share a review with you that was left on Apple Podcasts. And as always, I would just love it if you would leave a review for me and a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. It really helps us to reach more parents. And if we can reach more parents with our peaceful parenting message, not only will they find their lives get easier and more joyful, but we can we can change the world by really spreading the message of connection and empathy and that our kids are doing the best they can. This is a review from Caroline, and she says, I've done a lot of searching for parenting ideas that could change my children's behavior. Sarah Rosensweet's ideas and suggestions are by far the most helpful I have found. I'm smiling right now. She really brings the focus on improving the relationship with your children instead of controlling them, treating them with empathy and kindness and radical love. Her messages have changed my life. She has helped me improve all the relationships in my life, not just with my kids. Highly, highly recommend Sarah Rosensweet and all her workshops, podcasts, programs, and articles. Ah, that is so sweet. And you know what? That is so true. That peaceful parenting not only changes your relationship with your kids, but with all the people in your life and your relationship with yourself and how you look at yourself and your life. So if you're new to peaceful parenting, welcome. And I just, I'm so happy to be able to support y'all on this journey. It's such, such a great journey. So please you know, share this episode with a friend, leave us a review, leave us a five-star rating, and let's reach more people and help them improve the relationships with their kids and in their life. So back to today's episode. It is, as I said, guest expert interview with Seth Perler. Seth is an executive function coach. If you don't know what executive function is, don't worry, we are going to talk about that. And a couple of things that I loved about this conversation with Seth. One is that he was just, he's an amazing human and everything that he talked about was just so in line with everything that we teach and practice in peaceful parenting and in terms of how we see children and how we support children. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, he'll you'll hear him talk about, you know, executive function and how it basically, you know, troubles with it often become more serious when kids reach sort of middle school age. However, there are signs all along that our kids need maybe some support with their executive function. So I thought that was really interesting. And I'll stop talking now so that we can meet Seth and you can listen to our conversation. Hey, Seth, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I just got off a call with my membership and I told them I had to run because I was interviewing Seth Perler for the podcast and a couple of them were like, oh my God, oh my God, it's so great. They're so excited. So it was really, it's, you, it was like a, a fan moment for you. So I'm, I'm happy to, to have you on. So can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Oh, yeah, that's such a... Uh... Not easy question because I do so many things, but my name is Seth Perler. I have a website called sethperler.com. And what I focus on is this thing called executive function, which we'll talk a lot about today that I wish everybody knew about, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about it. And a, a lot of kids suffer needlessly because we don't know a lot about it. So I have uh, on my site, sethperler.com, I talk about and my YouTube and podcasts and, and I have a summit called executive function summit.com. Obviously I like executive function, but I talk about neurodiversity, ADHD, 2E or twice exceptional kids and mostly, and this thing called executive function. So what I do is I work with students, usually middle high school and college who ha- who struggle with school. People come to me because their kid is failing out or they're, they're, failing a bunch of classes, or they're just really struggling. They're always behind. They're disorganized. And 
things like this. And, and I coach students and my students, typically almost all of them are very resistant. They don't want help or they don't want to try this or that. So I'm really good at work. And I like the challenge of working with students who they, they've just had a, a lot of negative experiences. So they really don't understand that they can apply systems and, and make them work and that it doesn't have to be torture. So I, That's great. I like helping them figure out really how awesome they are and, and what their strengths are. And, but then also get them the systems that they need, not only for school, but that they use for life. And then I coach parents because doing this just with the kids and not with the parents doesn't get you very far. The parents yeah. have to be part of the process. I teach teachers and therapists and do talks and I, I wear a lot of hats in the executive function world. Nice. I think, you know, we were just talking before we started recording about how old the people are in my, how old the children are, are in my community, the, how, how old the, the parent, how old the children are that the parents have, I guess that's the way you want to say it. And so <clears throat> there may be parents who are listening who don't have kids who are struggling at school, possibly yet. My understanding is that as kids get older, it becomes more and more clear when their executive function challenges are happening. So maybe they, they might have executive function challenges that are not showing up in school yet, but they might be showing up in just every day, you know, remembering things or, you know, go and get ready for bed and you go upstairs and they're, they're naked reading a book on the floor instead of putting their pajamas on, that kind of thing. So so for anyone who just heard what you said about helping middle schoolers and up, this podcast is also also for, for you. So can you give us just an explanation of what executive function is? Yeah, but I'd like to respond to what you just said. Sure. So... I usually work with people in middle high school and college because the way that I put it is the the red flags aren't red enough earlier. And a lot of times what happens is, is that a child will go to middle school and the hand holding stops and everything falls apart. If it's not in middle school, it's often at some transition time going to from middle school to high school or going from one year of middle school to another or whatever, or from high school to college. But Yes. The, and, and then people say, well, how soon should I start, you know, trying to uh, support their executive function as soon as possible? And great teachers for younger kids do this really well anyway. But the sooner, the better, because once you see a kid really struggle in middle high school and college, like it's it just gets harder and harder and takes longer and longer for them to build the skills. This is about skill building. So the sooner you start conscientiously doing that, the better. So anyhow, just wanted to. Okay. Well, no, I, that's a perfect, I mean, maybe we should talk about executive function and then circle back around to that because I would love to hear more about the red flags aren't red enough because that's, that's exactly what happened with my youngest child. She didn't get diagnosed, assessed or diagnosed for ADHD until she was in the middle of grade seven because she had kind of, she'd been kind of floating along through elementary school. And what I look back on and I realize it's the fault of group work. <laughs> group work was, was why we didn't catch a lot of this earlier because she, she was able to just you know, she, she's bright and personable and teachers liked her and none of it got, none of it got flagged until she was in the middle of grade seven. And then all of a sudden, holy cow, she has having a hard time. And thank goodness we did get her assessed. But I, I think that it would be so helpful for parents to know what to look for if they do think that their kid has some executive function challenges and how to start helping them. So, but before we go to that, the your phrase is beautiful, red flags that aren't red enough. T talk to us about what executive function is. Yeah. And when I talk about what executive function is, this will kind of help you know what to look for. So executive function is how the front part of our brain is developing the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobe, the, this front third of our brain. If you put your hand on your forehead, it's that area right behind your hand, this huge part of the cortex, the squiggly part of the brain, it helps it's developing and it, it continues to develop until you're 25 or 30 years old. It's the last part of the brain to fully develop. So that's very good. That's very hopeful to know that there's plenty of time. But as the brain is developing in all these different areas, people's brains develop differently. There's a term called a asynchronous learning or asynchronous development. We all develop differently at different rates in different places, but there are general tendencies. You know, most kids, for example, learn 
kindergarten and third grade learn multiplication and cursive. And so there are developmental tendencies for a lot of things, but we do develop very differently. Well, executive function for kids with executive function challenges, struggles, delays, whatever you want to call it, the brain is still developing and they are the the brain is learning how to do several different things. Some experts say there are three executive functions. Some say five, eight, ten. I talk about thirteen, but essentially, I want you to think of executive function as anything the brain needs to do to help you get things done. So, for example, you and I are recording here today. Here are some executive functions you and I had to use to record a podcast. We had to manage time. We had to prioritize this over video games or whatever you and I are, whatever we would prioritize over it. Like we have to prioritize the important thing. We had to organize ourselves. We had to plan. You and I talked before. We planned weeks before. We did a pre-interview today. We had to plan. We have to regulate emotion. You know, we have to inhibit. So I might see something, a squirrel, an interesting squirrel out the window or whatever. And I have to, you know, focus my attention and concentration here and not get distracted and inhibit distractions and inhibit saying things like, oh, I just saw a cool squirrel fly, you know, whatever. But anyhow, executive function are all of the things that the brain has to do to help us execute, that's why the word executive, to execute tasks. Now, playing video games does require executive function. Your child's passion areas or interests or play or drawing or reading or those things all, even watching TV, these all require executive function. If you're trying to get the kid to the dinner table and you can't pull them away from the TV, they are very focused and they're concentrating. They are inhibiting. They, they're avoiding the distraction of you telling them to come to the dinner table while they're, they are prioritizing that thing. The, the executive function is working. The problem comes when we have to execute on non preferred tasks, things we don't feel like doing, things that feel daunting or overwhelming, things that are not fun or interesting, or that's where the problems come in is when, so obviously we don't have a problem with the interest areas or the hobby areas or the passion areas where the child wants to use executive functions. So what happens is, is that they build executive skills in their interest areas really well. But when it comes to other non-preferred areas, then they really struggle and the deficits really can show up. So I think that I think that with that definition, people Mm -hmm. with younger kids can probably imagine how how that would fit in. I mean, and I think that you just hit on something that I think is a real like a myth about executive function that I come up against all the time with people in my community, which is but he can focus on blah, blah, blah. Like they think, you know, when I, when I suggest to parents that they may want to get an assessment or look at some attention issues, they always say, well, no, he couldn't have, or, or she or whatever, they couldn't have attention issues because they can focus just fine on drawing. And I'm like, well, that's because they like drawing. <laughs> I heard something once that said that the ADHD brain often focuses on, and I know we're talking about more than ADHD, but the ADHD brain focuses on what's interesting, not necessarily what's important. I know I find that <laughs> true with, for myself. <laughs> that's a very similar, yeah, very, very similar sentiment. That That says it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are some things, I mean, we kind of just talked around one of them, which is that, you know, kids who have some executive function challenges might have trouble doing the things that they don't find important or interest or interesting. And what, what, in your experience, what are some of those, the things that are happening right along up to middle school, but aren't red flaggy enough to cause real problems for kids until they've already gotten to that age? Yeah. Well, first of all, a lot of parents haven't really heard the term executive fu- function, but I, for the ones who have, I've heard so many parents say, I am my child's executive function, or I am my child's brain, or I am my child's backpack, or I am my child's planner. 
So if you're doing a lot of really herding cats to get your kid to do their homework, to get them out, out of the door in the morning, to get them to organize their bedroom or their backpack or their papers, if they're always forgetting things, if they don't know where they put things, if they don't remember what's for homework, if they're generally disorganized and you're doing it for them, I guess any situation where you're you're feeling like you're always doing it for them, they may be getting their grades may be fine. But if you weren't making sure it got handed to the teacher, if you weren't emailing the teacher to tell them, hey, it's done. Sorry, we'll get it in tomorrow. If you weren't, you know, making sure and r- rushing them out to their extracurricular activities or these sorts of things, if those wouldn't happen on their own because they independently don't have the skills to do those things that are developmentally appropriate for most of the kids their age, those could be pretty big indicators. Mm -hmm. What would you add to that? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, the example I gave in the beginning about, you know, you ask a kid to do something that has maybe more than one step and they are really hard for them to do that. I've had some clients who say, my three-year-old can follow a four-step instruction, but my seven-year-old can't follow a four-step instruction. So that's one thing that I've noticed, at least with my clients, that's, that's often a sign that, that they might have some exec, their kid might have some executive function challenges. Yeah, that's working memory. And that's part of executive function as well. Or that has to do with working memory. All all of these executive functions overlap. They work together. So uh, it's not like you use one independently, but that's a good example of uh, requires a lot of working memory. Yeah. So if you say, okay, go to your bedroom, get your shoes on, uh, grab your backpack and grab that important piece of paper that and, and seven minutes later, they're just sitting there. Yeah. On the ground playing Legos. Yeah. Yeah. That's- <laughs> So, okay. So, and, and I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm not sure totally, but I'm pretty sure you wouldn't say, okay, if you're listening to this podcast and you are your child's executive function, just stop. I'm, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't say that there must be some scaffolding steps of how to get yourself out of that role and build those skills. As you said, your work is all about skill building. What, what, how, how does one do that? If, if we realize that we are our child's executive function. Well, I'm really glad that you just used the word scaffolding. And for any of you parents who like to take notes when you listen to podcasts, that's such a great word, scaffolding. That's such a huge theme in what I do. You really have to start from where somebody's at. And that's a big problem that we have in schools because schools are designed to run through a curriculum in order and different teachers use different chapters of textbooks or different parts of the curriculum. And it's just kind of a mess because that's not how the brain works and that's not how differentiation works. So great teachers differentiate well, but culturally our society says, okay, we have a linear way of going through a body of work curriculum, if you will. And or standards or common core or whatever, however you want to think of it. And, and that's, these kids aren't linear like that. So we do need to scaffold from where they're at and build. You're going to get so much farther by going so much slower and, and more conscientiously. So yeah, you can't just stop doing everything for them. And the, the pendulum swings, you know, parents will do everything, 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 get really frustrated and be like, okay, then you, you do it all yourself. And then everything falls apart that, you know, that it's in the middle there. It's okay. It's really looking at, I mean, the way that my methodology works and I I hope you and I get to chat about, so basically I, I love what Sarah is doing and I'm so curious about more about how her methodologies of guiding parents. And there's so many awesome experts out there that are doing so much good work. It just blows me away. But my methodology is, is that I talk about, I have different models for different things, but one is, is that I talk about systems, mindsets, habits, and routines. So systems, you can look at your child and what systems do they need? You could just pull out a piece of paper and just write that question and really think through what systems do they need? And you can think about what systems does an adult need because they need a different version of that same system. They need a system for managing their papers. They need a system for managing their backpack. They need a place to put their backpack. That's not just anywhere they feel like throwing it when they get back. They need a system, you know, a a really easy system you can think about is like the kitchen. You know exactly where the forks go, 
the knives, the milk, the cups, the plates, the dishwasher, the sink, everything in the kitchen is a system that it's very frustrating if that is not maintained in a household, right? So that's a really concrete linear system I can mention here. It's not so concrete with kids. You have to really think about it, but it kind of is. They need a system for putting their clothes away or cleanup time or and they need the system to be easy. So you could, let's say you have a system for putting school supplies away. You could have one of those little bags that has different compartments and everything that goes in the, the special compartment. Do not get that stuff for these. So this is my opinion. You can do whatever you want, but do not get those things for these kids where everything has to go. You want a catch all for all the school supplies in one little bag or box or whatever, rather than like specific places, unless the kid wants that. But usually they're only going to do that in their hobby areas. But you can write down what systems does my child need? So I talk about systems, mindsets, habits, or routines. What mindsets hold them back and what mindsets help them? The mindset that holds you back is anything that's resistance. I don't want to. This is stupid. Why do I have to do this? I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. I don't well, how do like you it. How do you overcome that? Because you, you spoke about how a lot of the kids you work with are resistant. And I know well, that, that parents that are going to relate to that. That goes to a whole other conversation. So okay. I'll try to adjust some of that. <laughs> But then you can think of what, just if I'm going to be brief about it, think about the opposite mindset of any of those. The, the I can, the Carol Dweck, I don't know if you know Dweck, yeah, but yeah. the mindsets that help us to believe that we can do something and that make it smaller, more manageable, and not so overwhelming. So we have mindsets and then we have habits and routines. So if they know how to use their planner, but they don't have the habit or routine, how do we build the habit? Now, back to the scaffolding for any of these we really want to start where where they're at. So if they're expected to do, you know, X, Y, and Z homework or chores or this or that, you really have to look at what can they do? How can we break that down and chunk it down into such a small bite-sized piece that they can have success with it? How can we make it more fun, more interesting, smaller? We have to get the basics down, then we can build on it. And and like you said, when people are like, oh, well, they, I'm, I'm just not going to do anything then, that does not help build the skill. Now, I'm going to go on to a, a different topic a little bit. I'm not, it's not resistance yet, but I'm going to talk about another big myth that's very relevant here, which is the can't versus the won't. When we perceive that a child won't do something and it's in fact a can't, then we use an intervention that isn't going to work. Yelling, punishment, trying to reward them that if they do it, lectures and reason and logic with a lecture, we're just going to convince them and help them see the light through our long discussions about things or whatever the case may be. We're trying to, quote, motivate them with punishment and pain or the promise of rewards or logic, motivate them by helping them see the light, how easy it is and how much easier everything would be if they just did X, Y, and Z. Those things do not build skills. And then the this is similar to what you said before, but then the parent or teacher can say, but I know you can do it. I've seen you do it before. That does not mean that in the context of this moment with whatever emotional dysregulation is going on and what are in the complexity of the things that they're being asked to do, it does or not the mean that they can do right? it in that, that they yeah. have the executive function in that moment to do yeah. what you've seen them do before. Mm-hmm. The stars are not aligned enough. Mm-hmm. It feels too big, too overwhelming, too much. It And, and that goes back to the scaffolding and the, what I use the term chunking a lot, the chunking it down into very small manageable bite-sized pieces that they can have success in executing. And sometimes it's super frustrating for parents because that bite-sized piece is so small, you know, it it seems like, and and I use a silly example here, but I'm like, okay, can you write your essay right now? No, I can't do that stuff. Okay. Can you write a paragraph? No. Can you write a sentence? No. Can you write a word? No. Can you write a letter? No. Can you write a dot? Yes. Okay. We'll start there. And you, so much of my work is helping kids learn how to trick themselves into getting started. So we can think about motivation, procrastination, self-starting, task initiation. These are all a bunch of executive function words. Oh, that I need can, that, Seth. 
right? <laughs> so we can talk about that. But so often, and I, I'm, Sarah and I are on video here so she can see, this is one of my favorite tools, which is a little digital timer. You know, it's tactile, it's auditory. You can hear it. I can feel it. Um, but I can say, okay, cool. Can we work on your math for, and I do a lot of what's called false choices for three minutes, five minutes, or 10 minutes. And even if they say three minutes, I don't care. I know they have 30 minutes of math. I don't care if they say they can do three minutes. It's about getting the train going. And you have to really think about your kid through the lens of where their mind is at, but also, and I don't know how much I can get into this today, but also where their body is is at, where their emotions, their nervous system, their emotional regulation is at in the moment. Because when we try to use logic and reason and lecturing to convince somebody to do something they don't feel like doing in the moment, and we're not understanding that it is not a logical discussion, they are having an emotional experience. They're feeling like they're being yelled at. They're feeling like they're not enough, like they're not good enough. They're feeling like they always can't do anything right, whatever the, the thing is. It's not just the thoughts around the narrative and the story that they're having, but they're also having a physical sensation in their body. Now, I like polyvagal theory a lot. And if any of you are taking notes and you want to look into polyvagal theory or somatic therapies, they are having an experience in their body of a little bit of fight, flight, or freeze, or stress, or shut down, or it's a closed sensation. If you were looking on video, you could see I'm closing my shoulders right now. It's a it, feeling overwhelmed or feeling like you're being asked to do something that you resist. And we can think about things that we resist. So for everybody listening right now, think about something you really resist. It could be having difficult conversations. It could be certain tasks. And, but Doing the taxes? Taxes. I'm trying to finish mine right now. That is, yeah, I resist it. Yeah, it's so daunting for me. So it's very heavy, closed. Now, when we're in a great space and we're having a great time, we're doing something fun, we have an open, free, connected, you know, it's a completely different physical sensation. So I know that we're talking about executive function here, but one of the things that I end up talking about with people is the physical body. It's not just the narrative and the story, but we want to acknowledge and notice what's going on in our kid's body and mind at those moments. We're going to get a lot further rather than just sticking with the logic or consequences or the punishments or rewards or all of the defaults and really think, okay, I've seen them do it before, but I'm going to bite my tongue and I'm not going to say that. I'm going to really imagine what's going on with them right in this moment. Not try to just have this dialogue to convince them, but really get to what is going on with them. I might even ask them a question like, hey, I noticed that your shoulders are doing this or your face is scrunched up or your voice changed and you sound have an angry tone. You know, what's that about? And like getting into the moment. So I can't move my kids forward and my client kids, I cannot move them forward with logic and reason and trying to just convince them. What I do is I acknowledge where they're at. I hold space for them. If you've heard that term before, it's a great way of saying I hold space for them so that they can feel safe to tell me where they're really at. When they feel safe and regulated, then I can say, okay, can we take this baby step? Can we do this small thing and see what happens and do an experiment? And can we try to use the planner? This is one kids resist a lot is using planners. They have to learn skills of planning. Kids with executive function challenges particularly need to learn skills with planning because it is going to hurt them so much in their future goals if they do not have these skills. I mean, everybody listening can think of adults that they know that have poor planning skills and have really shot themselves in the foot and limited their choices in life. We want our kids to have possibilities and opportunities and choices and freedom in life, not limit their lives. So planning is so important. I know how important it is, but me telling a kid that doesn't make them want to use a planner. Now, I, I might have a conversation like that with them, but I don't really care so much about a lot of dialogue around that. I care about, okay, humor me. Let's do an experiment. Can we, and I, and I think of how can we make the most simple planner you could ever have 
for what for whatever wherever ever they are with scaffolding. For some kids, it might be a note card. For some kids, it might be an actual planner. For some, it might be on their phone, just the note thing on their phone. It's not even the calendar on their phone, but they're willing to use the notes section on their phone, whatever. I don't care. I am going to scaffold from the smallest place that I can get them to have some small wins and move from there. So that was a big circular conversation. I hope I no, I, I love that. And just like a couple of things I want to pick up on what you said is that, you know, trying to get kids to do do better, you know, in quotes by being hard on them or using logic or any of those things. I think it's really helpful for all parents to remember that kids want to do well, right? Like they they want to do well and that they, even if they're struggling, they're they're doing the best they can. It's that thing that you talked about can't versus won't, right? Like, yeah, they're they're doing the best they can. They want to do well. You know, if you're familiar with the work of Ned Johnson and William Stix read The self, Self-Driven Child, and I love the quote of kids have a brain in their head and they want their life to work out. I think that's just such a, a great place to start all of this from, even with little kids when we're talking about just, you know, the the daily routine and, and getting along and doing things in the house. Like they really, it's impo- so important to remember that positive intent. Always assume positive intent. I mm-hmm. That's one of my favorite, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I wanted to pick up. And the other thing I wanted to pick up on what you said is something that people in my community hear me talking about a lot, which is, I mean, you said polyvagal theory. I love polyvagal theory also. But we always talk about, like, is your kid in their thinking brain or not in their thinking brain? Like if they're overcome by fight, fight, flight, or freeze, dysregulated, you could say a million things and they're not going to take it in. And so really that feeling of feeling understood and safe and accepted is always the place to start from whatever you're trying to get someone to learn or trying to get someone to do. So I just, I love that crossover because we're just, you know, that's the human way, whether we're talking about math or, you know, not throwing your food on the floor or whatever it is. And then that next to, yeah, attachment theory, the words that you just use, but that, that is that we, we all want to have secure attachments and essentially you have secure and insecure attachments. And then you have an insecure, you have anxious and avoidant. You can all look up attachment theory. It's something that I think is really important when working with kids is understanding that. But but we w- all want to feel secure in, with the people around us, whether it's our teachers, our parents, our friends, our car mechanic, whatever, our veterinarian. We want to feel secure with them. And to feel secure means that we want to feel safe, we want to feel seen, we want to feel heard and understood and known and like somebody's got our back. And in those moments, our kids aren't feeling, you usually aren't feeling secure. And then it, it's, it's harder to get, I mean, you can really threaten them into taking action, but that's, that's just not sustainable. Yeah. It's, it's not healthy. Yeah. I'm not sure where this exactly, I think there is an overlap with talking about executive function, but what I see so much with little kids in school is if you've got a kid who's, you know, on the spirited side of things and they have a teacher who doesn't like them or sees them as like having behavior, you know, being behavioral instead of maybe neurodivergent or spirited or what, what whatever it is, they act so much worse because they don't feel safe. They don't feel all the things that you just said, right? And then they can't learn because they're going through every day feeling unsafe in the classroom because they know the teacher doesn't like them and sees them as a behavior problem. Yeah, they don't feel seen. They don't feel like someone's got their back. They don't feel known. They don't feel understood. And again, it's the can't and the won't. It's, It's a teacher who assumes that it's a won't. And there's a lot of misunderstanding with those teachers. And there are those teachers. And unfortunately, for the parents listening to this episode, you all are going to really run into those teachers because those some of those teachers, okay, now, most teachers are phenomenal. There are some teachers that shouldn't be in the classroom. And there are some that should be in the classroom, but haven't learned this stuff yet, but are willing to learn. But there are some that are just rigid and don't belong in the classroom. Yeah. I saw with my, with my daughter, I saw she had, you know, I I look back at all the signs about, and she's, she's okay with me talking about her ADHD publicly, just so you know, she gives me permission to do that. But I look back after we got her diagnosis and there's so many signs that I didn't see, but one of them was every single teacher she had from junior kindergarten through whatever would talk about her needing to raise her hand before she, before she talked, right. And the the shouting out and luckily, 
yeah, luckily they liked her. So she didn't get labeled as a behavior problem. But it was like, I found this note that she wrote to herself when she was like in grade three that said, I want to shout out, but I won't or something like that. Like she, (laughs) she just, she struggled with that so much, but no teacher saw that as anything but a willpower question. Yeah. And the shame that, that these kids, you know, sometimes the teacher will say something and I, I was a teacher for 12 years and I saw teachers doing this and I, and I, and I still have families who tell me stories around this stuff, but they'll say, they'll say some little dig and it's very small, but the kid feels it so deeply. And it's just a little tone that, uh, that somebody can use that's contemptuous. I think that's the best word for this. If it's contemptuous, it really hurts. You know, these are human beings with feelings and we're trying to raise them up, not hurt them. And I I don't think, I think people's intentions are generally good, but I don't have a lot of tolerance for adults who shame kids. Yeah. Well, I think if, if they don't, if no one's ever challenged them on all children are doing the best they can and they want to be good, they just don't know, right? They're not people, but there's so the narrative out there is so strong about, you know, when I was in teacher's college, I was actually taught, to catch kids being good mm-hmm. as if default being good, yeah. was that they were bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, I love that saying, yeah. Yeah, and I think also it's good to mention that something that I do as a tool with working with kids who, with the catch and being good and with these sorts of things is when, let, let's say that a, a child were to call out in my class, First of all, as a teacher, as an educator, I have the perception, if they're default, let it be mine. Like, if my class is bored, it's not because they're not putting forth effort. It's because I'm a boring teacher in the moment. What do I need to do to be more engaging, to make the content more engaging, to make the class more engaging, to make the, you know, so first of all, we want to start there, I think, is, is putting it back on ourselves and ask what we can do. But also when things, let's, let's just use the example of somebody calls out is to really turn it into a positive because there is positive about, about that. We have so many, you know, little shaming things. And this happens a lot with females in class in classes is calling them chatty, right? And that's a shaming word to say you're being chatty. That's shaming. Well, they really have gifts of communication. Yeah. One of my most horrible right? this memories. This can be a gift. Yeah. One of my most horrible memories was in grade one. So I was a chatty kid and I got put in the talking box, which was a refrigerator box with a desk in it that you had to go and sit in if you were talking too much. And I just remember being so like horribly embarrassed to have to sit in the talking box. And look at what you do today. <laughs> I know you I talk all day. You <laughs> your gift for talking, right? This is, it's very important for you, you know? And so if, if somebody like calls out, it'd be like, oh gosh, you are so, I'm so amazed by how excited you are about this topic. Yeah, enthusiastic. So you can start like that and then mm-hmm. you could say, you know, can I help you learn how to raise your hand or help you learn how to pause? Can I help you get a skill? This is a skill. Can I help? Can I help in that? You're not going to do this in the middle of class, but you're, you're going to be like, how can I creatively come up with how to help this kid build the skill of self-restraint or inhibition or pausing or yeah, have it, have a tool. And again, if there be fault, let it be mine. Like one, if I really needed kids to think and I didn't want someone to call out, like I would have to prep the class and be like, this is a really important one where I don't want anyone one to call out thumbs up. If you all understand that you're not going to, you know, <laughs> or something like that. But anyhow, I don't want, I want to, we have a few more minutes. I want to get onto any other topics you. Yeah. So I guess I just want to make sure that we've kind of covered some ideas for scaffoldings when we do see those you know, that we are being our child's executive function when they're in those younger years. So what I'm getting is, you know, make sure that you're interacting with your child in a warm and and safe way when you're doing this sort of problem solving is one thing I kind of took from what you were saying. And to start really small, start with like really small steps towards them developing. Can you say again, your four things, systems, systems, mindsets, and then I, I, it's three because I lump habits and routines together. Okay. But Yeah. What systems does your kid? So first of all, I want to say that this stuff is not easy. 
I, I really, for anybody listening, really would hope that you would, you know, sit down with some paper and pencil and notebooks and sticky notes and note cards and a big table and really, really, really think through everything you need to. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Therapists, coaches, books, groups, right? Put that on your sticky notes or whatever. And, and really look at, you know, the problems, the big problems, your fears, your hopes, lay everything out. This is work. This is takes time. This takes effort. This takes energy. It's not like come listen to some podcast and get a few tips and tricks, like really invest your time into really thinking these things through because you will see progress. So I just want to say that there's no magic bullet. This isn't quick. Not You're not just going to get a couple tips. Like take time and write it out. Think it through. You write it, think it through with other people who can be helpful to you. This is, you're, you're, I don't know. I guess the seriousness of watching these kids struggle is where my head's at right now. Like this is not a joke. Like sit down, take time, take the time it deserves. So first of all, I want to say that. Secondly, yeah, with my methodology, you can jot out like systems, mindsets, habits, and routines that they need and creative ways to do it. Some of the things that I would say is chunking. So I talk about chunking by time and task. That's like scaffolding, breaking things down into small pieces by time with timers, by task with making your tasks into subtasks. You're, if your kid with executive function challenges probably cannot clean their room because that is a multitude of subtasks that your brain can see, oh, this needs to be done, this needs, they can't, but they can probably pick up two socks or pick up socks or put books on the shelf or whatever, you know, something. So really break things down. Also play, have fun, laugh, smile, hug, connect. Like it doesn't have to, like, remember how it does, it just doesn't have to be heavy all the time. Like really put a, a, a lot of levity into it. It's so funny because I use that those two examples that you just said when I talk about the room clean. I always say, make it fun and break it down. Like, okay, let's first put all the books on the shelf. Let's pick up all the dirty clothes, you know, breaking it down and put some music on. And so we're in total agreement coming from different directions on those on those tasks. That's why I want to hear. I'm so interested in your methodologies because they're I what I find in uh, on the summit. I've interviewed so many people that they and you have on your podcast that, that you, we hear the same things. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not the, the good news is it's not rocket science. Yeah, totally. So what about the I forget the word that you call resistance, you know, say you just still I mean, maybe a kid who just feels like they're never going to be able to do it or mm -hmm. they don't want to do it. Do you have any suggestions of where to start to get kids on board? Yeah, let me talk about the don't want to. When I, when I talk about resistance and the can't and the won't, I will say that as kids get more jaded and get older, there becomes more of a won't. They become very, very good at their resistance, and they become very good at their inner critic, which is something we don't want kids to be building. But a, a lot of times they really do. That inner critic gets really big for them, and they it really gets so daunting. So that those are usually the kids that I'm working with. So when a kid, either way, when a kid's really resistant, I always want to come back to that. There's the narrative and the story, the narrative, and the narrative in the body that they have a narrative and a story in their mind about everything and that they have uh, physical reactions or responses to these things. And I really want to hold space for them because if I'm going to help a resistant kid move forward in their life, they have to know they are safe or they're not going to take the risk to reorganize their backpack or to ask a teacher for help or to go to teacher's office hours or to check their homework over after they finished it. Or these sound like little things maybe to a lot of people, but for these kids, this emotional component, it's so important to understand that it's very real and that we have to create a safe space for them to take whatever tiny step we decide on. Now, in taking a step, anytime we can use that, we can get, well, we have to get buy-in and ownership. But the more buy-in and ownership we get, 
the better. So if the buy-in and ownership is all the parents, that is not helping the kid build skills. So there has to be buy-in. Well, how do we get buy-in? I think the inclination is, well, we'll use the logic and reason to convince them that they should be bought in and how important it is. Well, that doesn't do real good. We can do a little bit of that, but really the buy-in to me comes with the ownership, with questions like this. What are you going to do to solve that problem? How can you come up with a creative idea? What are your thoughts? And asking them what they think. And in your mind, you might be like, that is not going to work. Most of the time when my brain goes, that is not going to work, unless I know the kid really well, most of the time when my brain goes, that is not going to work, I go, wow, that's a great idea. Tell me more. Let's talk that through. Wow. And what about that? I want to really have an open heart and really listen because they have to be heard. Now, what's really interesting, Sarah, is a lot of times when we give them ownership and when we really, and it takes a long time. And I think this is hard for parents because parents are like, this just needs to get done or he's going to get an F in this class and be in summer school. And I don't have time to drive him to summer school this summer. And then, or he's going to have to retake it in the fall. And you know, so, but you have to slow down. And when we really do take it slow and listen to them, what often happens is, is that they'll talk through their great idea and they'll be like, oh, actually that's not going to work. That is the magic you want. And then if they say to you, what do you think? And what's your idea? And you're the adult. Oh my gosh. Now they're asking you instead of you dictating to them. I mean, that's a different vibe. That's a different conversation. That's a different place, headspace, emotional space, where you can really, really come up with real workable solutions and then baby step, figure out how to baby step your way towards whatever the little goals are. I love that. So it's really coming down to self-determination in a lot of ways too, right? Like, what do you think? What do you want? How do you want your, as you said before, you want your life to work out and lecturing kids in the face is taking all away all of that self-determination and assuming the opposite of positive intent, Mm -hmm. which would take away any motivation that they might have to begin with, I would think. Yeah. And it, and it's, yeah. And, and you said self-determination and I would say like the buy-in and the ownership, but th- it's the same mm-hmm. autonomy. Yeah. Agency. Totally. Yeah. But we all want to feel like it's our life. And, and it, of course, as they get more into teenagehood, they want more and more and more independence, even though they may not, <laughs> they want more than they're capable of having, you know, they want to be able to do whatever they want, be treated like an adult, even though they're not acting like one. Okay cool. We know that, Mm -hmm. but still they need, if we're going to help them, they need to really be seen. Mm -hmm. I love this, Seth. Thank you so much. I want to mention that. Sorry. I didn't hear what you said. And believed in as well. Yes. I think, you know, my grandma was so good at this. She, she'd be like, I know you can do it. I know you'll figure it out. I, I don't know how she worded things, but somehow it was just like, it was so simple, but it was so empowering. But I do that a lot. You know, I, I know you'll figure out the right answer. And and sometimes I'll say to a kid, let's say it's in office. I might say, cool, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come back in five minutes and I'll set my own timer. I'll, I'll come back in five minutes and I'm going to ask you the same question. Why don't you think about it? You know, sometimes they just need space or you can say, you know, next week or tomorrow morning, let's talk about it. Like you don't have to figure I, I think giving kids space too. like kids don't process like adults. A lot of times adults expect kids in a conversation to respond so fast. And I think that a lot of times when kids lie or say a mistruth, I don't care what you call it. A lot of times when they do that in the heat of the moment, like they just want you to get off their back. Yeah. It's not that they want to be dishonest. It's like they feel this pressure and they're just going to tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. Because or make something up fast. because they feel like they have to answer. And make some, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we don't give enough wait time. So I talk about wait time a lot. We didn't get to that, but I talk about wait time a lot and spaciousness. I know you have to wrap up. Yeah. I, and I just want to say everything that we didn't get to, I know I've spent a lot of time on your website and your YouTube channel, and I know it's really rich. There's a ton of stuff out there. So just tell people the best place to learn more about you and what you do. And then I've got one more quick question for you. 
yeah, and I'm redoing my whole site right now. So I have a new starter guide, executive function starter guide. But yeah, go to the site, sethperler.com, S-E-T-H-P-E-R-L-E-R.com, or look up Seth Perler executive function on YouTube, I'll pop up, or look Seth Perler and podcasts on Google, I'll pop up on a bunch of podcasts, and my summit, executive function summit.com, which is coming up soon, and it's phenomenal. We'll put links um, to all that in the show notes too. Yeah. And that's where you can find me. Great. Okay. I've got one last question for you. What is something that you wish all parents knew? Great question. I could go on for days, but I won't. Something I will, and great way to end. Something I wish all parents knew. I guess, and this is totally inspired by Debbie Reber, but that you are the perfect parent for your child, that you have all the tools that you need. You have what you need to help your child. And I I think that, I guess, in that, that the most important thing to me is that the relate, and this is how I begin and end every presentation when I present, but is, is the relationship. That is the absolute number one most important thing is retaining and building your, and having quality time. Yes, you're going to have arguments. Yes, you're going to have homework battles. Yes, you're going to have challenges and all that. Those things are important. School's important. Grades are important. Blah, blah, blah. Quality time regularly, all the time, really deeply connecting with your kid without devices, without TV, without this and that, connecting with your child, looking them in the eye, listening, the attachment theory, that your child feel heard and seen and that what they say is important and that they matter and that they have a sense of belonging. All of these things that are relational, that are in secure attachment, you can, if that makes it easier, but that the relationship in your child feeling connected to you and you feeling connected to your child in that presence, knowing what's really important, your child is in your house for whatever, 17, 18 years. Maybe they're, maybe they're living there until they're 35. I don't know, but you know what I'm saying? You, you, yeah. Your child is a child for this precious time is so precious and the quality time and how there there's, there's how I forget the term. Anyhow, how we, so choose. listen, you could, you could be a peaceful parenting coach. I could. Yay, <laughs> Every, I mean, everything I, you just I, said is just so in line with everything that we teach in peaceful parenting. And I'm so grateful for you coming on the podcast today. And thank you. This is, I know this is going to be really helpful for parents. Sarah, thanks so much for what you do. And parents, thank you so much for being here and taking the time. Thanks, Seth. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.